All right, so um, we've talked about keeping your trade secrets, either when you're disclosing them under Rule 56 or by not disclosing them at all through massaging your claims. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how you can lose your trade secrets without even disclosing them. And the theory is that when you file a patent application, you're uh, giving up your trade secrecy in whatever it is you're patenting, even if you don't actually disclose it. And so when you get your patent, you are treated as waiving your trade secrets uh, in everything that should have been disclosed under Section 112, even if it wasn't actually disclosed. So uh, full disclosure on my part here, when I first saw this theory, I thought it was bonkers. Uh, because what I had always thought was the case was if you don't disclose it, it's not disclosed, therefore you can keep it as a trade secret. But the more I thought about this idea that everything that should have been disclosed under Section 112 is treated as having its trade secrecy waived, the more I thought it makes sense, at least in concept. And l l let's talk about this a little bit. So the idea is, okay, you have a patent and uh, there's a quid pro quo, right? You disclose your invention, how to make, use it, and best way you know. And in exchange, you will get a uh, exclusive rights to make you sell off for sale the invention as long as uh, it's innovative and it, it meets the requirements for patentability. All right. Well, if you don't provide your full disclosure, but you still get a patent, you've essentially gotten your quo without the quid, right? There's no quid pro quo, you've just gotten the benefit. Well, what do you do when someone makes a deal and they uh, get their benefit of the deal, but they renege on providing the benefit that they promised to the other party? Well, you can give them damages in form of money, but sometimes money isn't possible, right? It's You can't make someone whole uh, when something is um, not, not something that can be compensated for in money. Well, I would say technology. There's a good argument that a 112 disclosure is that kind of a thing. All right. What else can you do? Well, you can get specific performance. Specific performance says you are basically forced to cough up the thing that you promised. Um, and in this case, that's a 112 disclosure. Now, you may argue, William, William, that's all well and good in contracts, but this is patent law. And patents... Uh, have a provision that says if you have an invalid patent, for example, because it doesn't have a 112 disclosure, uh, it can be invalidated. And there you go. That is, um, that, that's the way you handle this. But I would argue that's a pretty lousy way to handle it. Why would I say that? Well, for one thing, it's only prospective. Uh, so you will have gotten, or I will have gotten, if I'm the person who didn't make the right disclosure, I will have gotten all the benefits of my patent until such time as it's invalidated. And that could be a significant benefit, right? I've cleared people out of the market. I've gotten licensing. I've gotten promotional ability. Um, also, it only impacts the very, very small percentage of patents that are actually litigated and invalidated. So in most cases, it's not going to be there at all. Uh, and... If it's a 112 best mode violation, then even if I am one of the very small percentage of patents that are litigated, I can't be invalidated for it because of 35 USC 282 B3A, which excludes best mode from the reasons why you can invalidate a patent. So uh, patent law actually is a pretty lousy way to deal with this problem. You know what's a good way to deal with it though? Trade secret. Why trade secret? Well, for one thing, as I'd mentioned, it's very similar to the sort of contract remedy of specific performance. I promised that I was going to give you a full disclosure of my invention. I didn't do it. You, you the public, or you the patent office, gave me the um, uh, the disclosure. You gave me the, uh, the exclusive right. I should be forced to give what I promised to give. Uh, second, it actually fits really well with the theory and the purposes of trade secrecy. So in Ohio, for example, um, the purpose of Ohio's trade secret law, part of it is to maintain commercial ethics. And I would argue that promising to give a full 112 disclosure and not doing it isn't particularly ethical. And therefore, allowing me to keep the trade secrets that I promised to give up isn't consistent with the purpose of trade secret law, whereas making me give them up is entirely consistent with it. So it is something it sort of works conceptually, right? Similar to specific performance. It certainly fits with the uh, goals of patent law as well as with the goals of trade secret law. So what do the courts say about this? I mean, I mentioned I saw this in some court opinions. What have I seen? Well, 
not a lot. Uh, there, there really isn't a whole lot of support for this. Uh, the most recent case I am familiar with is a 2010 case out of uh, Eastern District of Wisconsin, and that case didn't actually even um, address it. It mentioned it, uh, but what was brought up in that case was not the argument that everything that should have been disclosed but wasn't loses its trade secrecy. The argument the um, litigant made in that case was the trade secrets in question must have been disclosed because they uh, would have been necessary for Section 112. Therefore, since they have a patent, they must have disclosed their trade secrets. And the court said, nah, nah, that's not right. What if they didn't do it? What if it's not a good 112 uh, argument? And then in a footnote, the court said, you're not arguing the p proposition that I'm proposing here, which is everything that should have been disclosed but wasn't loses its trade secrecy. Um, and the court said, if you had, the only case we know of that supports that is a 1985 um, Illinois District Court case called Christensen versus Colt. So I would say that's actually pretty not great legal research, uh, if for no other reason than because in the Christensen case, um, the briefing included a reference to a previous case that also supported it, uh, Syntex Ophthalmolics uh, versus Nowicki. So there is a little bit more than that. But I would say that it's not just the case that uh, Christensen, the district court case, referred to. It's also what happened afterwards. So to understand this, I need to give you a little bit of background on Christensen. Um, that case, weird case, um, but essentially Christensen tried to make M16 uh, parts and Colt, they're the makers of the M16, sent messages to his suppliers saying, hey, don't sell to Christensen, he stole our stuff. And Christensen um, said, hey, these guys are driving us out of business, antitrust violation, um, but knew that Colt would say, well, wait a minute, that's our intellectual property, we have trade secrets, and therefore we're allowed to enforce our trade secrets, which is true. But Christensen said, all right, we think they shouldn't have trade secrets because they also had patents. And even though the patents didn't disclose the trade secrets, they should have. Therefore, they should not be allowed to use those trade secrets as a defense to our antitrust claim right now. And the district court said, hey, that's right. Um, you lose your trade secrets and everything you should have disclosed under Section 112. In addition, you also lose uh, all the trade secrets in the M16 that people would need in order to make these things. Um, so, you know, big win for uh, Christensen. Of course, it goes up on appeal. And here's where things get weird because uh, it goes to the Seventh Circuit. Seventh Circuit says, why are we deal? Why do you give this to us? Um, this is actually about patents. Uh, and specifically what it said is um, we find there's two ways that something can arise under the patent laws. A case can arise under the patent law. Number one is it's a patent claim, right? Infringement. Uh, number two is it can arise under something, but the patent issues are necessary in order to figure out whatever, you know, the, the thing nominally is under. And what the Seventh Circuit said was, we find the instant dispute falls within this second category of arising under cases um, because Christensen's right to recovery, although ostensibly based on antitrust laws, would be defeated by one or sustained by an opposite construction of the patent laws. Think about that for a second. That says, depending on whether or not the material should or should not have been disclosed under Section 112, that will actually control the results of the antitrust claim. He did not say, the Seventh Circuit did not say that depending on whether Christensen's thing is bonkers, which is a state law antitrust, excuse me, state law trade secret issue, then that will control, right? He didn't say that this theory is bonkers and therefore there is no argument here. What he said is this is a theory that has to be determined and it has to be determined by considering whether or not the trade secrets needed to have been disclosed under section 112. Did it explicitly say we endorse the theory? No. Does that appear to be a logical entailment of what they said about jurisdiction? Yes. And so the Seventh Circuit said, we're now going to ship this off to the Federal Circuit. All right, Federal Circuit gets it and says, you guys have bollocks this up. You completely screwed up. Um, no, we, we, we don't deal with this because this is under antitrust. This isn't under patent. Um, but they said, look, these guys are getting ping pong back and forth. Uh, so out of the in the interest of justice, we're going to... Uh, talk about this thing, and we're going to say 
no, you didn't need to disclose this under section 112. Uh, they pointedly did not say we reject or affirm this theory. They said, you know, we're not commenting on that, um, but there was no need to disclose these sec trade secrets under section 112. Therefore, you know, the, the defense falls. Uh, this goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, Federal Circuit, you're wrong. Um, you, you didn't have jurisdiction. Uh, so you were right that you didn't have jurisdiction, but you were wrong to consider it in the interest of justice. Um, so we're going to send this back, back to the Seventh Circuit. Seventh Circuit now has it again. What do they say? Do they say this theory was bonkers? Now that we have, we, we know we have jurisdiction and it isn't arising under the patent laws, do we say this theory is bonkers because we're considering under state trade secret law and we say that they are crazy? The answer is no. What they said is the first substantive issues we must decide, must or whether the district court erred in finding that Colt failed to meet the enablement and best mode requirements of section 112. But that is only relevant if the theory that Christian present, Christensen presented had merit in the first place. The fact that they believe they must address this, and they did address this, and they agreed with the Federal Circuit, of course. They said, look, there is not a section 112 issue here. At least is implicitly an endorsement of the theory that uh, you lose your trade secrets and things that should have been disclosed. Now, uh, is, does this necessarily mean you win? I mean, no, it's only Seventh Circuit. Um, this was under state trade secret law, so this is a federal case. Illinois um, state courts could disagree, right, because trade secret state law, or they were before the Defend Trade Secrets Act, which didn't exist at this time. Um, bottom line is, it's at most persuasive talking about it, and it's really talking about it by implication. But I think the implication is there. I think the implication is there. Um, other than that, there's really not a whole lot, one way or another. Uh, the coolest case, I think, is uh, Hickory Specialties um, versus Forest Flavors. And that, in that case, um, the Middle District of Tennessee, the first thing they did is they totally endorsed the theory. They said, yeah, this is right. This is right. You lose your trade secrets and everything that should have been disclosed under Section 112. Then later, uh, they came back and said, yeah, we were totally wrong. Um, we're going to withdraw all that. Uh, but the reason they said they were withdrawing it was because they had apparently been given briefing saying that the Seventh Circuit had uh, reversed the theory. Not true. The Seventh Circuit said they didn't need to disclose it. They did not address, as I had mentioned, they did not address the merits of the underlying theory. So Hickory Specialties, not a great um, case in my opinion. It goes both ways and it I, I don't think it correctly characterized what the Seventh Circuit did. Uh, but I think it shows, at least at the first instance, just like what you had in um, Christensen itself, like you had in Syntex, like you had, I believe, at the Seventh Circuit, it is potentially a persuasive theory. Uh, not a lot of case law support, but conceptually there's something there. And I think what this shows is there's a risk. There's a risk in not disclosing material because they could lose their patent, right? Colt, it could have gone the other way. Colt could have lost their patents and been forced to disgorge their trade secrets. So when you are deciding what you do and don't include in your specifications, I think it makes sense to consider yeah, it's a little bit out there, but at the same time, it's not without any support. It's not without any conceptual uh, appeal. And you could lose your trade secrets by not disclosing them um, while you still get a patent. So there you go. Fun stuff. Patents and trade secrets. Uh, you can disclose them without losing them. You can avoid disclosing them entirely, but... If you try avoiding disclosing them and you uh, step on the wrong side of the line, there is a risk that you may be forced to uh, lose and disgorge them under this uh, line of cases with uh, Christensen versus Cole. So good luck, good patenting, good trade secrets, and I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.